Welcome to each one of you. And welcome to the second day of the CPAT um, Symposium. We are grateful this morning for allowing us to be able to meet in this place and to continue our discussion where we left it yesterday. We are grateful for each one of you that is here, even as we pray for those who are still on the way to come. We pray that the Lord will make their journeys easy. So we continue on the theme, updating tradition, African Christianity, theology, and the contemporary arts this morning. So before we start, we want to just um, thank God for the gift of life and for the opportunity that he has offered to each one of us to be able to be seated here today. And so we will pray. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you so much that you've allowed us to see this day. We don't take it for granted that you've allowed us this morning to come into your presence, to worship you, to honor you, because you are God and our Father. And in everything that we do today, Lord, Father, we just want to commit it before you. And pray that, Lord, may you speak to us in a clear voice, even as we struggle with so many things that, Lord God, we want to do in your ministry. So, Father, we ask that your presence will be with us today. And for every speaker and for every person that you put something in their hearts to share with us today, Lord, we pray that you give us clarity in everything that we do today. We thank you, Lord, and we honor you because you are our God. We thank you that Jehovah God, you've also blessed us with a servant today, that as she shares your word, Father, we pray that may your Holy Spirit continue to speak through her and help us to be able to understand your wisdom and the mysteries of your word, that Lord God, we may be able to put it into practice and that, Father, at the end of it all, it is for your own glory. We thank you and we bless you, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, uh, we will start our session by the Amen. opening devotion. And our opening devotion will be done or brought to us by Professor Gillian Mary Bediako, the Deputy uh, Rector of Acrofi Crystal Institute. So, Auntie Mary, you're welcome. Please, please. a clap for Auntie Mary. Thank you very much, Dr. Angaina. Good morning. Everyone. By way of introduction, before we get to the passage, um, our, our theme is on bridging the cultural divide, Paul to the Ephesians. We saw yesterday how Paul was concerned with cultural dynamics and the challenges uh, concerning updating tradition related to that. Today, I wish to look at another passage from Paul that deals with culture, also deals with cultural issues. The Apostle Paul is well known as the Apostle to the Gentiles, and an important feature of his ministry, which comes to a climax in Acts 15 at the council held in Jerusalem, is his advocacy for Gentile converts to be welcomed into the new community of believers, the new Israel, on equal terms with Jewish converts, an advocacy that met fierce resistance from the group of Jewish believers known as Judaizers, 
or the circumcision party, who wished to insist on circumcision for Gentile converts. For centuries, there had been build, building up increasing hostility between Jews and Gentiles, whom the Jews despised as dogs, and from whom they kept themselves apart as much as possible through cultural distinctives such as strict observance of circumcision and food laws, for example. And so now, when all were called upon to live together in the new community of followers of Jesus, cultural habits died hard, such that pressure from Judaizers threatened to undermine the emerging multiculturalism of the young church and was, was in danger of degenerating into a cult within Judaism that would require circumcision for entry and observance of other Jewish laws. This would amount to reducing Gentile converts to the status of proselytes, that is, Christians but on Jewish terms. An insight into how deep-seated such instincts were among Jewish Christians may be glimpsed from a passage uh, covered yesterday from Galatians chapter 2 verses 11 to 14 where Paul confronts even Peter for not acting in line with the truth of the gospel in ceasing to eat with Gentile believers in Antioch just why this is unthinkable for those who are now in Christ concluding Christ redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Galatians 3.14 It is clear therefore as more and more Gentiles were being converted and entering the new community of believers that Paul felt the need to provide the theological undergirding for the new cultural arrangements of equality between Jew and Gentile that are required for all followers of the Jesus way. And how to deal with that deep-seated hostility, the dividing wall of partition that would undermine them. The most extensive direct teaching on this is in Ephesians, which was most likely a circular letter from Paul to all the churches of Asia Minor. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 to 22. Ephesians chapter 2 from verses 11 to 22. I read, Remember then you the Gentiles in the flesh, the ones called and circumcised by those called circumcised, which is made in the flesh by hands, that you are once separated from Christ, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you are once a far off have been brought near in the blood of Jesus of Christ. For he is our peace, who made the two one, and has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility in his body, abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances, in order that of the two he might create in himself one new humanity. So make peace. So making peace, Reconciling the two in one body to God through the cross, bringing the hostility to an end in it. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, 
in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the in the Lord, into which you are also built for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And that is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much. Um, those of you here in the, the hall have on a sheet of paper uh, this text set out in a particular way uh, for which I'm indebted to Kenneth Bailey in his book Paul Through Mediterranean Eyes Cultural Studies in One Corinthians. And the reason is that in the form of argumentation known to be common to Middle Eastern cultures, including Hebrew culture, and identified as being found in the Bible, progression from one idea to another is not the straight line logic progression we are used to, but the heart of the argument comes in the middle section, and the final section connects and answers to issues raised in the first section. Hence, this uh, di diagrammatical presentation of Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. For the text shows that Paul, the rabbi, was well versed in this style of argumentation and employed it to good effect in this passage. Which means that the issues he raises in the early part are recapit recapitulated and dealt with at the end with the heart of the matter on which everything hinges comes in the middle. In verse 11, the word then links this passage with the previous verse, verse 10, which reads, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, in which God prepared in advance for us to do works which arise out of the saving grace which is the gift of God. This shows, this connecting link shows that the passage that we are looking at constitutes an elaboration of that handiwork where it relates to cultural identity and its inbuilt tendency to undermine what God has done in Christ. Paul goes straight to the heart of the problem addressing head-on, as it were, the predicament of Gentile Christians, who, from a purely cultural point of view, that is, in the flesh, were the uncircumcised, as seen by Jews, including Jewish Christians, who, also culturally speaking, in the flesh, designated themselves as the circumcised. Yet already here, by qualifying both parties in the same way in the flesh, Paul is laying the groundwork for a deeper kind of identification marker through the gospel that would also be common to both and Israel of the spirit, as well as implying that in spiritual terms, physical circumcision is not the decisive factor for Christian discipleship that some Jewish Christians will make me doubt too. In verse 12, Paul further elaborates the Gentile pre-Christian predicament. They had no share in the heritage of Israel, being separated from the Messiah, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope in the sense that their previous religious beliefs offered no salvation promise, or at best only intimations of such, and without God, that is, no intimate knowledge of God in the world. These were well-known privileges by which Jewish Christians considered themselves superior to all other peoples. It would have been hard for them to let go that sense of superiority, given their spiritual heritage in Moses and the prophets, and Jesus' own fulfillment of the law and the prophets as the promised Messiah. These are weighty issues, but Paul offers a way through, as we shall see. 
dealing with the crux of the matter in the central verses that make a new perspective and lifestyle possible, and which he then goes on to expound, answering one by one in reverse order, enjoyed by the old Israel, become theirs too. Verse 14, even more radical still, Jesus fulfills the prophecy of the Messiah as the Prince of Peace, in a way probably unanticipated, by becoming the peace between Jew and Gentile, and bringing near of the Gentiles and their entry into the privileges of the covenant through the cross means that not only has Christ reconciled both Jew and Gentile to God, but also to each other, creating a new harmony. He has also nullified that very real religious barrier between Jew and Gentile, symbolized in the barrier that kept Gentiles from the inner courts of the temple in Jerusalem. Just as in like manner, the curtain separating the holy place from the holy of holies was rent in two at the point that Jesus gave up his life, as we learn from Matthew's Gospel, making possible full access to the Father through the Son for all. Verse 15 goes further into further detail as to how this has come about. Jesus abolishes does away with the laws and ordinances that were so sacred to Jews for the sake of bringing both Jew and Gentile together in himself as a new humanity. This verse lies at the center of the passage, indicating its supreme importance for the whole. Thus cultural distinctives, especially when they have religious sanction and significance, are relativized so that they lose their ultimacy and thus their power in the face of the new community, the church, the people of God that Jesus creates around himself. They lose their ultimacy because he is the full, Jesus is the fulfillment of the commandments and ordinances as we learn from the Sermon on the Mount. Likewise, since Paul is addressing Gentiles as well as Jews, all the best aspirations of other faiths embodied in their cultures and which also set peoples apart find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Verse 16. Now the recapitulation of Paul's argument begins, working backwards being our peace in the way Paul has just described, Jesus is actually making peace, being active in reconciling the two in one body through the cross and ending the hostility. Through the cross he thus drains away the power of these rules and regulations. In Colossians 2.15 it talks about disarming the principalities and powers, draining away their power as well as their hold on Christ's followers once they come to realize this amazing truth. And this is obviously a work that Jesus goes on to through the history of the church. Verses 17 to 18. So Jesus' earthly ministry of proclaiming the kingdom of God was in effect a preaching of peace to both those afar off and to those near. There is no distinction. All people of all cultures need the peace and reconciliation he affords. He grants all that access to the Father that had been denied to all Jews and Gentiles and which is now effected through the one spirit who animates all his followers. Verse 19, so recapitulating further, in re reverse order from verse 15, Gentiles are no more strangers, aliens from Israel, or separated from Christ, 
but rather are members of the household of God. They have thus received the blessing given to Abraham, which was intended all along to come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, as well as the promise of the Spirit, Ephesians 3.14. Verses 20-22 Two final recapitulations show how thorough is this work of reconciliation and incorporation into a new community where all belong together, no longer defined by distinctives of circumcision or Gentile cultural distinctives or lack of them, and with fresh overriding identity markers, a new heritage. There's a new set of ancestors in the apostles and prophets. Christ being head and uniting focus, and a spiritual community which is still a work in progress where God dwells, working through his spirit. Briefly, then, some implications for bridging the cultural divide. What may we learn here from Paul's teaching for our time and context? Clearly, the fact that we are holding a symposium series at all on bridging the cultural divide between theology and the arts is an indication of the problem. The church in Africa inherited a legacy, um, a cloak of superiority that came with Western missions. A superiority not derived from the gospel, but from its associations with Western culture. As we noted yesterday in various sessions, this this superiority, Christian superiority, infects many aspects of church life uh, in relation to traditional culture. Uh, one symptom, for instance, is the elevation of English, and especially the King James Version, into a superior sacred language to the detriment of Mother Tongue Version. Even if the churches have moved away, from simply imitating Western liturgical forms, have introduced more indigenous styles of worship and have an appreci appreciation of aspects of African culture. Profound suspicions <laughs> over many aspects of culture, including the arts, especially those which have religious associations. Uh, we mentioned yesterday the fear of syncretism. It all hangs in this uh, legacy of Western Christian superiority. So there are parallels yeah. with the problematic cultural dynamics that Paul is addressing in this passage. And Paul's considering of Jew and Gentile as fundamentally equal in God's economy is instructive for African Christians and indeed all Christians in our time. Questions such as, is it possible to be both truly African and truly Christian, should not need to be asked. All peoples and all cultures have an equal stake in Jesus Christ, who comes to redeem persons in their cultural specific humanity, along with redemption, transformation of their cultural expressions. For this also is conversion. And this brings me to my final point, which relates to the phrase in verse 15, translated uh, in the, our passage as, who has made us both one. Another translation, an early version of the RSV, has creating one new man in place of two. And uh, the, the New Bible Commentary article on Ephesians interprets this as one Christian church instead of two ethnic groups of Jews and Gentiles. Uh, he's more explicit. He says, both Jews and Gentiles, having lost their ethnic and cultural identity, gain something in return which is far better, a place in Christ's body. They thus form a new race of men. I venture to say that only a Christian who is cultured like, uh, as most Western Christians were for a long time, could offer such an interpretation. 
unaware of how impossible it is, and in fact contrary to the gospel. For Jesus did not come as some kind of generic first man, uh, produce a new kind of generic follower, but entered culture-specific humanity as a Jew, and showed what redeemed, transformed Jewishness should look like, and so offering a paradigm for the transformation of all other cultures and faith. Paul is indeed speaking of one new humanity, but one in which cultural distinctives find their right, rightful place. Uh, Bailey puts it better. Each shared with the ethnic identity of his or her heritage, and on a deeper level, is an equal member of the new household of God. Paul's ethnic identity was Pharisee Judaism, as he proudly affirms in Philippians 3, 4 and 5. He also participated in the new humanity, in which he was a central figure. Thus the good news of this passage of scripture for African Christians and for all Christians who are here is that they do not need to substitute their ethnic heritage with a new church culture. With all the uh, identity problems that creates, and some of which we considered yesterday. The challenge then is to reflect on and work through Paul's perspective on universal cultural equality in the gospel that's given here. For any sense of cultural inferiority or superiority embedded in our cultures, to leave behind the fear of syncretism and so allow Jesus room to work a transformation and show the way forward. So the task according to Ephesians this passage for this evening is to embrace the vision of one harmonious community manifesting diverse redeemed cultural forms and to be open to see and to learn from the unique insights into the gospel emerging from, say, the scriptures in each one's mother tongue. For those whose gifts lie in the arts, the task would surely be to see how one's own traditional art forms may be updated by being turned to Jesus and used to glorify God for the edification of all. Paul affirms this vision later in the epistle, chapter 4, uh, uh, verses 12 to 13. Right of the grace given to us as Christ apportioned it, meaning his gift to mankind, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And we need insight from every culture in order to that thing. Amen. Thank you. A round of overplus to what we've had this morning. Auntie Mary, thank you so much for the, the word that you've shared with us this morning and an encouragement to us who have and are still struggling with the issues of gospel and culture and the issues concerning uh, the two worlds that we find ourselves in. And so I, as a reminder today, we see that uh, we are reminded that the world have been broken. And so the laws that kept us from having this conversation, because I know that as a church for a long time, would want would not have wanted to have this discussion. And it's something that we are now getting ourselves into. And so in a way, we are trying to do a reconciliation between the world the worlds of the, uh, the arts and also the theological world 
and how the two, even though art has been in existence for quite some time, and the church has actually been one of the institutions that have really used art. And so much of what we know um, as children growing up is what, the kind of art that was displayed to us uh, on the image of Jesus, uh, who he is, and the pictures that we see. And as Auntie Mary was actually uh, speaking, then I remembered, uh, an, an, I mean, something that happened when we were in class, when we were doing our Bachelor of Divinity. And the top, I mean, we were actually working on Jesus Christ in African thought. And I remember the lecturer then asking how we understand Jesus from the African uh, context. And one of my colleagues gave us a story of one of his sons. They were living within the compound. And one of the sons one day walked to the mother and said, I have seen Jesus today. And the mother was like, Jesus. And he said, yes. So one day while they were walking, then he showed the mother who she actually said that was the Jesus that he had actually saw. And, the, and when the mother realized that it was actually one of our classmates from the church of, uh, I mean, from the Orthodox church, you know how they dress with their, <laughs> with their, I mean, the cassocks, they always walk around with their cassocks and, and, the, and the cap, but they keep a long beard. So that is the picture that has been painted of Jesus. And one, uh, immediately the son saw the man, then he said, I have seen Jesus. And so that is the power of art. The power of what uh, has been presented to us for generations. But then after Sunday school, after they grow up, what happens? So that is what uh, the kind of engagement we really need to have as we go on in our second day of deliberation. And just as something that Auntie Mary has um, encouraged us this morning, uh, especially in terms of uh, issues of superiority. Because one of my struggles when I was my research on Bible translation was how uh, the Bible translators, even though it's, a, it's an African a Sabah translation, the pictures that they have used, uh, the, portray uh, the portrayal of, of, of the, the, the disciples of Jesus as white, the pictures instead of the i mean even putting them in black and white they are actually white people and that is the portrayal of of who jesus is and that that made me to think this is something that we've discussed this is something that we are discussing we will continue to discuss but the kind of because that is the art that is what is presented to us and that bible will go down in the village and that will be read by children and will be read by, I mean, every other person knowing very well that this is the portrayal of who Jesus is. But what is our understanding? And that is why I say that there is power in art, not just in the drawings, but also in the buildings. I come from the Anglican church, so all this uh, artistic, uh, including how they do the windows, everything has a message. So how, how do we even uh, explain some of these things that have been brought down to us? Does it really correlate to what we Africans believe in the first place? Or can it speak to our situation or our context? And so we are grateful for God using you this morning to be able to remind us that these walls have been broken just because Jesus came to be able to make us one, to reconcile us. And as we go through this process today, to uh, establish what the Lord wants us to do uh, and has called us to do this morning, we pray that the Lord helps us to be able to see beyond what we have already conceived in the past and also to be able to absorb what is presented to us. So thank you very much, Auntie Mary. I will now want to invite um, my brother.
in our next session, Dr. Abraham Waegi Nganga, my brother from Kenya, even though not based in Kenya, but having had um, time with him when he was in ACI, I remember very well him welcoming him me to uh, a coffee and making me feel at home. But one thing you cannot take away from Abraham is his passion for his work. Whatever that he does, he does uh, with a lot of passion. And whatever he speaks, he speaks with a lot of passion. So I will invite uh, Dr. Abraham Nganga from Liverpool Hope University to give us a plenary address on the topic, Echoes of Transcendence, Spirituality in the African Literary Tradition. Abraham, Karibu. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Uh, yes, indeed, I come from Kenya, and uh, even though I'm away, I feel like singing a song that Wale Shoinga composed that says, I love my country, I no go lie. I still love my country, even though I'm far, far away. And what a pleasure to, to be able to join uh, with you all this morning. Um, I was I enjoyed yesterday, and I benefited immensely from all the presenters, uh, from the devotions to the speakers to the um, plenary sessions, as well as Auntie Mary's uh, session. Uh, thank you for laying the foundation for today's discussion. Um, I just want to share my outline, and then I will carry on. I begin by. Um, recalling how my journey started in terms of engaging with um, this, this area of study. Um, and I began by seeking to understand the place of the transcendent in African life and thought. And uh, the key text that I, I, I used for my research was, among others, but this was the primary text, was um, Jomo Kenyatta's Facing Mount Kenya. Uh, which was published in 1938. That date is key, and I will I will I will say why um, I emphasize the, the the time when it was published. I also um, explored a tradition of scholarship that was established by pioneer African theologians um, that many of us continue to follow today and to build upon. Um, as it briefly but also intended to use this as the, um, the, the, the framework for, for my discussion. Um, the three themes that I found very helpful in, in studying and understanding the writings of African theologians, as well as uh, African writers, you know, creative writers. And these three themes were, well, and still are, advocacy of indigenous heritage, vision of greater human humanity, and then vision of transcendence. The climax of this presentation will be a look at S. of Wale Shoinka's writings. Uh, I have tested the, that uh, framework, the tripartite framework, and I've also critiqued his work theologically from a theological perspective. I hope to conclude this presentation by comparing Mount Kenya and Mount Kilimanjaro, or presenting Mount Kenya and Mount Kilimanjaro as a parable for revision of worldviews. Um, in focusing on Wale Shoinka, I will be exploring to what extent does, his, does he operate within the established tradition of scholarship, and also I will um, expound on what, what I have found to be a reconstituted transcendence what I'm now going further to, to describe as Shoinka's gospel of secular aesthetics. But there you are, charity begins at home. Um, just before I proceed, I just point out something that many of you might not have been aware, but something that is, is quite key in terms of what I will say later. Uh, the map of Kenya, you might be familiar with the, with the, with the, the map as it looks, 
But if you can see my cursor, where my cursor is, I don't know whether you've ever wondered why the, those who partitioned our, our countries, the continent, could not draw straight lines. Why is the line, you know, just there? Why does it go in and then come back to continue on a completely straight line? Well, the explanation is simple. Where that line goes in, that notch there is where Mount Kilimanjaro is. Well, in the original sense, Mount Kilimanjaro was inside of Kenya by the British and the Germans who have uh, yes, enemies. They're concerned over this matter and they decided, okay, each one of us will get a mountain. They are the two highest mountains in, in, in Africa. You, the British, you keep Mount Kenya, which is somewhere there. And you, the Germans, you keep Mount Kilimanjaro. So we'll allow you to, to shift the, the, the line and hence that notch. It is very close to Kenya. In fact, the town next to Mount Kilimanjaro uh, benefits from all the waters that flow from Mount um, Kilimanjaro, and that town is in Kenya. I'll come back to that uh, as, we, as I go on. So mine was a quest for an intellectual affirmation of my African Christian identity. And I began, you know, with, with testing on Kenya, which speaks about our people, uh, the traditional life of the Nicole people. The first big study culminated in the NTH dissertation entitled The Place of the Transcendent in African Life and Thought. And then, as I read Kenyatta's work, a work that was originally submitted as an anthropo uh, um, um, as an anthropological work, you know, it is an anthropological interest. Built at the London School of Economics and supervised by the famous Branislav Malinowski, was, was, was published as a book in 1938. Now, this date, as I hinted earlier, is significant. It was a decade that, that would yield multiple pioneering works by Africans. Uh, you recall those who have been at a coffee that um, D.O. Pagunwa, a Nigerian writer, a pioneer African creative writer, published his, his novel, The Demons of a Thousand Forests, uh, The Forest of a Thousand Demons, rather, in 1938, the same year as Kenyatta's work came out. It was also a time that provided the, uh, the, 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 the foundation for such work as J.B. Dunkler's Akan Doctrine of God, which will be published a couple of years later, as well as people like Amos Tatuola. In fact, both Amos Tatuola and Dio Fagunwa are rightly considers, considered the father, fathers of African literature. So not Chinua Achebe, not Wole Shereka, not Gudua Piyomo, but Dio Fagunwa and, and um, Amos Tatuola. Having undertaken this study, I was convinced of the simplicity of transcendence in African life and thought. Equipped to this conviction and passion, as Bella was saying, I pursued the line of inquiry. I sought, even in creative works by Africans, to discern the theological significance within African literature. Now, let me just say a little bit about um, Mount Kenya. Um, it was believed by the Gekoyo people, our people, to be their residence for their god and guy. Um, and here you have more than echoes of transcendence. It was the sight that you could not escape. Wherever you are in Gekoyo land, on the slopes of Mount Kenya, you could see Mount Kenya. It was the ever present, the overarching a primary existence under which you conducted your life. So Kenyatta writes this book from an anthropological point of view, but I just want to point out that, that for your interest, that Kenyatta also was trained in magical arts, the traditional magical art, arts of the Gekoyo people. So he writes with a deeper insight about the Gekoyo life but also spiritual life and religious life. 
He tells us that for the Gekoyo, their well-being uh, was premised on or their peaceful tillage of land uh, which supplied their material needs and enabled them to perform their magic and traditional ceremony, ceremonies in undisturbed ser serenity was premised upon facing Mount Kenya. For the Gekoro people to achieve this peaceful tillage of their land, contentment through childbearing and for the solidarity of the community, both the living and the dead, every member of the community was obligated to face Ngai as they related with one another. Every aspect of their lives was aligned with the worship of Ngai and to mutual coexistence. So facing Mount Kenya thus points to the, to the transcendent reality that validates human existence, albeit with an African bias. It is not a call to worship a mountain, but a symbol, symbolic call to direct all energy, mind, heart, and soul to the worship of the one transcendent God, Guy. It is also to live in harmony with fellow human beings in the light of the perceived presence and perceived reality of transcendence. Passing away from Mount Kenya, therefore, is tantamount to disconnecting oneself from the only source of life and rendering existence meaningless. In African religion, says Mamba, uh, Masi Amba Oduyoye, when words fail, symbols take over. As an interpreter of the Gekoyo life, and hence religion, Kenyatta engages with the key ideas that would come to describe the theological quest for modern African theologians. They will take up the discussion on the need to vindicate African indigenous heritage and perpetuate the vision of the transcendent as apprehended in traditional African religion as they envision a transcendent community where all participate as equal partners in the building of human civilization. This study was therefore able to demonstrate that Kenyatta was in fact a precursor to African theology and that African theologians would come to vindicate his aspirations. So armed with the understanding that anthropology begins at home, Kenyatta demonstrates that it is possible for people to benefit from other cultures and religions without betraying or damaging their own. The question, therefore, whether the tragedy of the modern world was the only outcome possible for the African encounter, African European encounter, was addressed by his vision of a greater humanity. The realization of the tribal unity, therefore, was shown to lie beyond ethnicity, for it pointed toward, towards a higher vision of human achievement. Within this vision lies human happiness. Kenyatta also shows that it is possible for people from different racial and cultural backgrounds to creatively integrate without inflicting damage to one another. This is significant in dealing with the fact of cultural and religious diversity in Africa in particular and the world in general. The test for such a vision was located in the principle of, quote, give and take, end of quote. The guiding light was from a higher source that transcends all human differences, yet is identifiable to every people, culture, and race. So through reading Kenyatta's Facing Mount Kenya and knowing the agenda of African theologians concerning the interpretation of African, the African past and that anti the African past and the articulation of modern African Christian theology, I perceived an interesting relationship between their respective ideas and persistent concerns. Pioneer African theologians, as well as later theologians, were all found to address similar concerns. This included the recovery, the recovery and continuity of the traditional African religious consciousness into African Christianity itself seen as the search for the key to understanding African cultural heritage, the recovery of 
and advocacy of African indigenous intellectual categories and vindication of the historical memory of African societies. They endeavored to trace the footsteps of God in pre-Christian Africa and developed that and developed what they discovered in their work in African theology. Also, theirs has been a journey that not only explores the sacred groves and the destroyed shrines of traditional religion, but one that also attempts to recover for African Christ Christian theology, the primary reality that validated all life expression, the primal vision of the transcendent as was apprehended by African peoples. Thus, their journey is our journey too. Across fertilization between the disciplines of anthropology and theology was undertaken with reference to pioneer African theologians. Uh, for instance, John, the ones listed on the screen, as well as others. Um, as well as relating the whole inquiry to J.B. Dankwa, a contemporary of Kenyatta, both born in the same year, a contemporary of Kenyatta, and a fellow representative of his own people, the Akan of Ghana. The centrality of the transcendent in African life and thought was identified as the hermeneutical key to the anthropological data in Kenyatta's work, as well as J.B. Dankwa's Akan Doctrine of God. The two works, published, as I said, in 1938 and 1944, respectively, both milestones in the religious itinerary of the African peoples, were designed as pre-theology, in the sense that they anticipated the quest of pioneer African theologians who would draw from Kenyatta and Dankwa in their exploration and expression of African theology. I should say that we also we still continue to do so even today. Kenyatta's work was also presented as an early representative of African literature in the articulation of the structure of the African society and the nature of the African mind which is anchored in their vision of transcendence. So many African theologians also upheld the sensitivity to religion that scholars like Kenyatta have exhibited in their scholarship as a major contribution to the African intellectual renaissance. Kenyatta was therefore identified as part of the journey to articulating African theology, providing materials or raw materials for exploring the for exploring and explaining pre-Christian Africa. His work makes African Christian theology both possible and relevant and can therefore be seen as pre-Christian theology. Similarly, he shows that Africans under the influence of new forces are not incapable of spontaneous adaptation. So before declaring Christianity to be an African story, these African Christian scholars demonstrated how African cultures and religious beliefs in themselves point toward Christianity. They were therefore able to say with conviction that the pre-Christian African religious tradition and the modern African Christian experience constitute one story, the story of religious itinerary of African peoples. To them, the ancient wisdom as Dankwa would say, the ancient wisdom is the testimony of God's presence in the culture and therefore needs to find a place in the new dispensation in the continuing renewal of society. They also believed that the renewal of society is not achieved by jettisoning the spiritual roots of ancient wisdom, but by the redemption of the totality of culture and history and the application in new settings. So it has remained a persistent desire of mine to explore the works of other African scholars, and I've been doing this for the last 10 years or so, particularly those who have engaged in creative writings to probe the extent to which their narratives reflect the religious aspirations of Africans and engage with the issue of identity the fact that large numbers of Africans have now openly embraced Christianity as their own religion, to the extent that Africa is arguably the majority Christian continent, suggests that 
any represent representation of their lives, whether in fiction or fact, must engage with their deepest religious sentiments. It is against the background of the literature that constituted my early education in English, as well as Swahili and vernacular literature, the novels of the novels and plays of Ngugi wa Thiongo, the poems of Okot Pibitek, especially his Lawin, Song of Lawino, and the Chino Achebe's novels, Things Fall Apart, No Longer at Ease, The Hour of God, which inspired the resolve as an African Christian to make connections with African literature and African theology that I focus in this study. This interest, it seems to me, is timely as there has recently been an awakening in Africa towards intellectual renewal and cultural reorientation, what we are describing today as updating tradition also. And there is a great need for African Christian theology to connect with it. I shall focus on the writings of Ole Shoinka, as I promised, as a, Ole Shoinka, who is a foremost exemplar of creative African literature. But before I do that, Permit me to make this point, or to recall some thoughts from JNK Mugambi. Mugambi states that the ongoing Christian, the coming of Christianity through the Euro-American missionary enterprise is the largest single factor that has contributed to the disruption of the social order and religious heritage of African peoples. This reality has been captured in the, main, in the many works of many African writers. In his book, Critics of Christianity in African Literature, Mugambi shows how prominent East African writers, as well as West African writers, have responded to the missionaries' presentation of the gospel in Africa, as well as their sentiment towards the expression of Christianity. He articulates how African creative writers, such as Ngugi wa Thiongo or Kurt Pibitek, Taban no Leon have driven, derived their plots, their ready-made plots from, from, the con, from contemporary African history with the assistance of imaginative conjecture. However, this has not altered the fact that their works are African and fully affirm the African sense of transcendence, even though some like Okopi Bitek and Taban, Taban no Leon have distanced themselves from the belief and practice of religion for personal reasons. But the underlying thrust in these works comes from the fact that most African writers from all disciplines appear to have maintained the vision of transcendence in their work, albeit from a traditional religious perspective. For the majority of these African scholars, as will be noted in, uh, later, their criticism of Christianity has been largely to do with the way the gospel was presented to Africans, rather than with the essence or relevance of the Christian faith. Even among those who are antagonistic to the Christian faith, with the exception of Taban Leon, who regards himself as an atheist, more precisely a disciple of Nietzsche, their works demonstrate their connection to and affirmation of the spirit world. The plots in Gugi's novels, for example, are narratives interlaced with biblical stories and the historical events in contemporary as well as traditional Kenya. Although he does not carry out an in-depth analysis of either African traditional religion or Christianity, he dramatizes in his plays, novels, and other literature the reality of an African life. To be an African, is to be anchored in body, mind, and soul in transcendence. Now, I would like to focus now on Wole Shoinka, uh, you know, uh, born in 34. Um, just to point out that his great great grandfather. When Daniel Olubi pioneered the establishment of mission in Yoruba land, he was the first African Nobel laureate, 1986. He was also awarded um, the Chin Prize in 2010. I attended this in the uh, work, the uh, Yoruba categories, Ricky and others. I will talk about it later. 
Christianity, he says, could not go to any setting and achieve his fullest potential. Well, he's the most prolific African writer. Uh, you can see um, his bibliography is quite long. He continues to write. He's just released a novel uh, last year, his third novel, and he keeps writing and reflecting. He's also an artist. He's recorded so, um, uh, some songs. He used to play the guitar. Um, he, he, he has acted in many films uh, or written many scripts of films and, and plays. So he's an artist proper, a complete artist in that sense although writing is his main preoccupation, a playwright, essentially. Now, I would like to focus more uh, on Wale Shoinka uh, as a way of probing how he deploys the, this tripartite thematic that I've suggested, uh, advocacy of indigenous heritage, vision of greater humanity, as well as vision of transcendence, uh, and also suggests where he might have um, gone on a tangent or uh, aside from the tradition of scholarship that was established by uh, those earlier scholars that we've spoken about uh, on the continent or in that diaspora. Um, and he says, he, for he as an artist, he's part and parcel of the community. So his concerns or his preoccupations, even his calling, uh, depend very much on the security of the society. And this is perhaps best expressed in his 1980 popular song, Etike Revolutin, which whose chorus I alluded to earlier on, I love my country, I know go lie, now inside am I go live and die. Some of you might have heard that song. Uh, also to say that Shoinka comes from a musical family. Uh, you might know of the Ransom Ekutis family, or even their more famous son, um, uh, uh, Felakuti was Wale Shoinka's uh, cousin, and he established the, the African shrine in Lagos, you know, where many people would go to listen to his music and his performances. Uh, I found it interesting when I visited Nigeria not long ago that the African shrine is being renovated and was um, the daughter of the renowned historian. Um, um, J.F. Adeajai. So just, just a, a, an aside there. But Shoinka tells us in this book that I'll focus on briefly, Meet Literature in the African World, that I have long been preoccupied with the process of apprehending my own world in its full complexity, also through its contemporary progression and distortions. And it says evidence of this is present both in my creative work and in one of my earliest essays, The Fourth Stage. Well, I would like to suggest that 1976 is a key date for Shoinka uh, and his creativity. This, this article was, he wrote to lament or complain about Shoinka's lack of uh, commitment to his Rockefeller Fellowship that he received in 1960 to research African traditional realities particularly ritual and drama. There was no report. He was given a lot of money, he was even bought a brand new Land Rover to travel across the whole of West Africa to research um, African ritual, drama, and, uh, and so on. But he didn't produce any report. So, a jolly bad fellow. Well, I have made the case that that report finally came in the form of myth literature and the African world, well, 15 or 16 years later, in 1976. Now, in 1976, Shoinka also published his long poem, Ogun Abibiman, and play Death and the King's Horseman, Horseman among other engagements. Well, um, it might be of interest to point out that in 1976, Shoinka also spent a considerable amount of time in Ghana, where he was one of those advocating for the teaching of Swahili at the university and so on. So 1976 is a very um, um, productive year. By any standards, a reckoning achievement for a year's creativity. 
But why 1976? Why this time? Why write this book or provide this report 16 years later? Well, Shoinka himself tells us in this book, Myth, Literature, and the African World. He says this book is a reinstatement of the values authentic to that African society, modified only by the demands of a contemporary world. He also says that it is a time of, it was a time then of externally directed and conclusive confrontation on the continent. And then he hits the nail on the head. He says, Africans, like his compatriot Bolaji, though, the Kenyan John Beatty, the, Mali the Malian mythologist Ogotomeli Kagame, Willie Abrahams, and Senegalese Sheikh Anta Diop, among others, you know, like um, uh, the Haskovits and the uh, uh, Father Plassi Temples. He identifies them as a new breed of de deniers. And hence, this book becomes a response to this new breed of deniers who have mounted a concerted assault that in ideological respectability on every attempt to restate the authentic world of the African peoples and ensure its contem contemporary apprehension through appropriate structures. He continues, he says, these self-deniers, they're not just new breed of deniers, they actually deny themselves. These self-deniers ought instead to be engaged in what should be the simultaneous act of eliciting from history, mythology, and literature for the benefits of both genuine aliens and the alien alienated Africans, a continuing process of self-apprehension whose temporary dislocation appears to have persuaded many of its non-existence or its irrelevance in contemporary world. So, from now on, 1976, in as far as I've understood Wallace Shoinka's writings, the tone changes. It becomes what I would describe as evangelistic, and hence the gospel of secular aesthetics. It is deliberate, deliberate now, to reset. Hitherto, hitherto he had been writing plays, he had been writing poems, he had been writing essays, but focusing on the first two thematics, indigenous heritage and vision of greater humanity. From 1976, there is a, an a, a, a changing of gears, if you like, and the, uh, the issues of spirituality come forward, religious engagement, and he is actually taking on African theologians, this, the pioneer African theologians that I've spoken about. In fact, someone like Ido is at the same university in Ibadan as Shoinka when he comes back to teach there. So this is very close to Shoinka. Now, several works take this evangelistic tone of Africa, published not long ago, uh, 2002. He uh, talks about African humanism and spirituality in an African-inspired age of universal understanding. If you go back to Ogun of Bibbinan, this long poem, you know, this, he, 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 he exalts the Yoruba god Ogun, his personal icon, as the uniting principle and Orumila's voice as an arbitrating voice. And he does that in this long poem, in the spirit of Shaka, the Zulu warrior. But Ogun presides over the black nation, over all the black peoples, wherever they are. In a recent book that he released uh, recently, Beyond Aesthetics, he also makes the case for African secular spirituality in relation to collectors and artifacts, hence beyond aesthetics. And then in his most recent work, it's a novel, Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth, he talks about the corruption of the priesthood and also the corruption of the political leadership. It's very graphic, it's very raw, it's very, very um, direct. And then there's an article he had published a while ago in the Guardian newspaper, UK Guardian newspaper. The title was Faiths That Preach Tolerance. In that article, he speaks of the secular deity as the harbinger of hope. And he talks about Ifa, the Ifa divination as the as the arbitrating voice. So it's a very 
the evangelistic tone that he takes on from 1976 in response to African theologians who are claiming indigenous African heritage for Christianity. And he says, hold on, hold on. And then he makes his contribution. He even goes ahead to what I would describe as he proposes scriptures. And he tells us in one of his books, in fact, it's a recent book, uh, not, not so recent, but a very well-bound book. It's bound like a Bible. It's got a hard cover. It's got a jacket on it. Uh, and he tells us in this book, The Seven Signposts, it's called, it's called. I present here certain precepts which I extracted and formalized from this religion some years ago. When during the battle to establish a place, it's a battle, remember. When during the battle to establish a place of communion with the Yoruba deities at the University of Ile, Ile Ife, the suggestion was made that this ancient system of belief did not qualify for consideration as religi religion because it had not, it had no written scriptures. Forgive my typo because it had no written scriptures. On the lack of scriptures, he says, this amounts to denying its most fundamental intuitions because they are not printed, annotated, and marketed. Now, notice the irony. This small book that Shoinka presents to the world, it's a very short book, you can read it within 15, 20 minutes, um, is printed is annotated and very persuasively marketed. And in it, he speaks of the seven signposts of existence. And he says, I wish to exhort you, study the spirituality of the continent. As in all things, selectiveness is key. I say to you, go to the Orisha, learn from them and be wise. And he also says, the religion of the Orisha does not permit, um, permit internet liturgy um, catechism or practice that pernicious dictum. I believe, therefore, I am. Nowhere will you find the sheerest sign of reasoning in the direction of human self apprehension. You will not find its corollary. You do not believe, therefore, you are not. Taking on the Christian evangelistic uh, approach to, to the gospel. Why? Ushoinka. Orumila, this arbitrative voice, does not permit it. Obatala, the other deity, can conceive of it. Ogun, his personal deity, will take up arms against it. Ogun is the god of war, mythology, so he knows how to fight. He will take up arms against it. Not one Odu of Ifa. These are the, the, the Ifa um, um, uh, writings. So much as suggested, it's not weakness in the character of this religion. However, it's not even tolerance. Now, I've made some emphasis with the bold there. It is simply understanding wisdom, an intuitive grasp of the complexity of the human mind and a true sense of the infinite potentials of the universe. So he goes again, to, he goes on to give the seven precepts from the teaching of the Orisha. And before he, he lists the seven, he says, they cannot be refuted by anything that has come down to us in lyric, liturgy, or mode of worship from these primordial forces that the constructed might of Islam and Christianity have failed to crush. And here they are, the seven signposts. These seven samples correspond with the function or the office of the, the, the key deities of the Yoruba pantheon. Obatala fulfills purity, loves, transparency of heart, stoical strength, luminous truth. Seek understanding of the signposts of existence. Is knowledge not within and around us? Ifa maps the course through shrouded horizon, horizons. Obun sets the example. Virtue wears the strangest garb. Comradeship in strife, meditation in solitude, the hardy root of self-sacrifice. Ogun liberates, rise beyond his shadow. Justice is the mortar that needs the dwelling place of man. Tango restores. Honor to the ancestors, 
Yet mind and spirit encompass more than mere litany of names. Knowledge is Orisha. Orisha preaches community, founded. The will of man is placed beyond surrender. Orisha reveals a self-destination. Well, you might be wondering, what is, how does Shoika understand spirituality? He tells us it's a territory of the ineffable, an awareness of an essence in all things that transcended the mundane. But I have identified a contradiction in Shoika's own experience of the transcendent in his fifth memoir. In, in, the, in his fifth memoir, by the way, so you know, he has five autobiographies. In his fifth memoir, the largest yet, he talks about um, he talks about an experience he had, which um, seemed to me to contradict what he's been telling us about the Orisha and about Yoruba religion against Christianity and other religions. But as I conclude, let me just um, point um, point us back to a warning that Quesi Dixon voiced in his theology in Africa some time back. He says. The theologian who fails to take account of the religious ideas and practices that are around him or her, even if and indeed especially religious ideas and practices which may not be especially Christian, may not realize the absence of religion from his or her theology. Now, it's a warning for all of us to heed. Now, a vice council, and this was reiterated uh, even yesterday at the devotion, and even Auntie Mary has continued in the same spirit. But while updating tradition, there are risks involved, but also plenty of opportunity. There is need to ground the gospel in African religious. Um, indigenous heritage is indispensable. In fact, it is God given, as Auntie Mary was saying. Um, religion is central to the experience of Africans, yet our cultural heritage or tradition is not the standard. Jesus Christ is the key, the standard, the supreme. Our exploration, therefore, of perspective, or e any effort we might undertake, must reflect the glory of God we were cancelled yesterday. Well, there's an older council that had been given to us by J.B. Danko. The discipline of the universal Nana would demand that if there's even one person, one race, one nation, which puts others in a bad light or, that, or does damage to them, then the universal community is bad. It stands in need of a good, a better Nana. It needs to discover a new type of ideal, a new messianic exaltation even as high and as exacting as the unsophisticated Sumun Bonum of that old man from Nyasaland. Are there meeting points or crossing points? Now, I recall what uh, Professor Philip Lai shared yesterday, origin, spirit of accommodation. In all things men, that's that race, ethnicity, culture, identity, national practices, or tribal kinship, Jesus to be the dividing lines, willing to become weak, making necessary compromises, all for the sake of the gospel, even as we engage and reclaim. In other words, I would even add to that, redeeming the arts for the kingdom of God. Kwame Bediako, speaking of origin, says, it's a daring intellectual enterprise. Whether we are artists, theologians, it's a daring intellectual e enterprise. When we seek to enter even the world of those who might be opposed to the, the gospel, to seek to understand in the first place, but also seek to redeem those elements to the kingdom of God. By the way, I put it to you that those seven signposts of, um, of existence that Shoenka has suggested are actually not against Christianity. They are things that can be identified with Christianity or the, the gospel. Now, the ironic potential in Shoinka's work, for instance, I'll just list them, there's no time to go into them. Um, for instance, he, could, he does not relate what he describes as eternal values or humanistic ends, justice, peace, and human dignity with the preaching of biblical prophets. 
but he bases them on secular humanism. He, can, he does not identify a good with Jesus, a reconciliation of humanity with God, which is the, 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 the role that Ogun plays and Jesus plays. Or at least Ogun with Pagunwas Akara Ogun, that hunter who seeks to go to the mountain to achieve his quest. There's also an avatar thematic in Wallace Inca's works, and he, he, he upholds Nelson Mandela as the best example of humanity. And I'm wondering, why not Jesus as the truest representation of humanity and God? That's what an avatar is, a true representation of God and humanity at the same time. Is there a better avatar than Jesus? Or even relate the concept of Alafia, a Yoruba concept of Alafia, with salvation in Jesus Christ. There is no conflict there. Or even proclaim, as was, as was, was done for many years in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in Europe and elsewhere, that art is ultimately directed at religious service and worship. Or that aesthetics can be a signpost to God. Beauty can be a sign, signpost to God. He does not do this. Things that are, leave us with that, what I'm describing as ironic potential in the works of Wole Shoinka. Um, I could talk about the, comparing the mountains again, which Shoinka does, but also say, just to make the last statement, that there's a call for us to revise our, our worldviews. Because if you are a Kenyan, for instance, I can call you, and you grew or you live under the slopes of Mount Kenya, perhaps you've never had an opportunity to see Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro itself being a more majestic mountain, a, more, a higher mountain than Mount Kenya. I'll just go back to Mount. Okay. And I wondered to myself, if my people could see Mount Kilimanjaro, which, which stood above the clouds, which is so grand, even to the eye, leave alone to the wildlife around it, wouldn't they have revised their, their theology, their worldview? I think they would have. But you see, we live at a time where we can actually see these mountaintops. We can compare notes with one another. We can help one another rise beyond the limitations of our, of, of our geography, of our worldview, of our religious understanding and lift each other up, and we asked yesterday, and we continue to, 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 to insist that all these things we can do to the glory of God, to the glory and honor of Jesus Christ, who is the highest, the high and lifted up, the true transcendent. Amen. A better Amen. applause to our brother. Thank you, uh, Dr. Waigu, for that presentation. It was quite some work that you did there. And I hope that every one of us is digesting. And hopefully we have something to share of what we've had today. And one thing that stood out for me at the end is when you said, redeeming the arts for the kingdom of God. That all this that has been given to us and the blessing that we have through the writers because that is a gift that God also gave to them. But what informs them is what they know. The world around them. The symbols that they understood. But one thing that also struck me with both uh, Wole Shoinka, I hope I said it right, and uh, um, our first president, uh, Kenyatta, is that both of them, of course, uh, at least I know of Kenyatta, was trained as a mission in mission school. But you see that later they come out and write about their own communities in the language and in the ways they understand. So they have both worlds, but they are presenting to, to us uh, what they understand from their own context. So that is the beauty of one, the gift that God had given to, has given to them, to those who write, because writing is also a gift and is an art that is not given to everybody. But we thank God for them and we appreciate the effort that you've been able to put down to help us to understand some of the issues that have been raised 
by these great African writers. Um, and so, thank you very much. And I will invite uh, a discussion. For those who have questions, those who are uh, online, you can raise your hand. And for those who are here, please just uh, raise your hand and then I'll give you the microphone. Okay, thank you very much, um, Diana Hopes. And then I am very much impressed with what we had um, as, uh, as Christians. That it's always a struggle, I mean, being very traditional. And um, sometimes as a believer, if you are seen going to your hometown and stuff like that, people look at you in a funny way. And, <laughs> you know, so I was impressed with some of the similarities he was showing. Um, I, I thank God that I had my own personal encounter with Christ. So I, I attest to who God is. And I tell people that the fact that the covenant God gave Abraham was circumcision. And in any, like my tribe, most tribes in Ghana, believe in circumcision. And so I don't see Christianity as a foreign religion as people has made it to be. And so it's so difficult to now bring things in identity. And, and I believe it's time that we take this serious as Africans. I was disappointed that... Um, to, to, to take the African religion as religion was <laughs> discouraged because it didn't have written text. I mean, I had a pastor friend who would always give a proverb and would say, this is the gospel according to the Akans. Then he would speak the Akan proverb. And that opened my eyes. And so I believe we have not been able to get deep disciples in Ghana because of some of these problems. Because we have people who may not want to speak English. And the Christianity, we, I mean, we all see, seems to be rooted in English. And these are certain habits that I believe consciously we need to take a look at to make a change. So that we, it will not be as if being a Christian is a foreign religion or something so far. But what we have here, that shows that we are indeed um, people of God and even in some of what we call secular in our traditions, are very, very godly. I, I read the Bible and I see Africa so much in it. Uh, Moses is Moshi, as in my tribe we call, and stuff, stuff like that. I believe it's time that we do that education for our children, right from the um, grassroots. The kind of Bible knowledge we are teaching the children, I don't think it matches what Africans are in terms of faith. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Doctor Doctor Nyanga, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is this is very deep. Very deep. I I recall um, the the day when. Um, uh, Dr. Nganga was defending his, his thesis. Uh, I was involved in the Viva. And there were some ladies who had come to visit the institute. And uh, they had come to see me, so they had to wait. So after the, the Viva, um, I went to my office, and uh, there they were. I had to explain to them why I was late. And I said, oh, we had a student who was defending his PhD thesis and uh, his topic was only showing them. And then they, they, they were so shocked, said, ah, we thought we were coming to a, a theological institution. What has uh, Woli Shoinga got to do with you? And I said, everything. Uh, you should have been at the Bible to, to listen to the relationship. Uh, and, and this tells us that um, the, the, the several areas that we have left, you know, uh, and it's quite exciting uh, listening to, uh, uh, to, to to Abraham. And so you have opened our eyes to uh, to the field of creative writing. And so maybe when um, you are now reading a text, you know, uh, maybe Tinoa uh, Chibi, uh, you are reading it with an informed 
uh, from an informed perspective. But, but the, the question um, I want to ask uh, is in relation to uh, Nugu Atiyungu. Uh, he's made so much impact. Uh, but they, they are among a set of uh, writers um, like um, uh, Kofi Auno uh, and others who, um, if you like, are estranged you know, from, from, from the Christian faith. Uh, they all have Christian names which they dropped. Uh, so they, <laughs> they see Christianity as in bed with colonialism. Um, particularly with um, Nguwa Thiongo. Uh, he's alive and he's still writing. I don't know, I mean, your comments, uh, particularly on uh, uh, Thiongo, um, um because he at a point decided to write in his mother tongue. Uh, I don't know what your comment would be, uh, particularly uh, with regard to literature uh, in, in African languages. I understand that some writers, creative writers, you know, like um, Auno and others too, with respect to the Christian uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Blasu, Dr. Blasu, if you could uh, ask your question, then uh, Abraham will answer the two. Thank you, Dr. Ngan. Uh, Dr. Wagi, I appreciate your lecture, and I agree with you, identify myself with uh, what I knew was happening in the early 70s, even though I didn't understand it at that time. I knew that in those days, in the early 70s, anytime we went to fellowship meeting, uh, there was this talk about Africanization of Christianity, uh, acculturation of Christianity, uh, contextualization of Christianity. Those kind of words were coming out all along we were just in Bible that we don't know what they meant. Later on growing up, I now understand how the struggle was with uh, the first the first products of uh, Western trained theologians like uh, uh, Bolaji, Dou and others were struggling hard to contextualize Christianity to make it Africanized somehow. Now in your talk, I don't know whether I heard you well, but you're saying that Soyinka was describing them as deniers. Uh, I didn't get clearly what Soyinka means when he described those who were struggling first to contextualize African Christianity as deniers. What were they denying? And was it a derogatory remark he was making about them? Okay, thank you. Should I respond or there's another question? Please go ahead and respond to the two. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think the first um, speaker made a comment to which I don't think I need to respond to, 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 our, to what she said. To Professor Lyons' question, uh, Professor, Professor Lai, you are a co-conspirator in this. In this, in this. <laughs> but it's it's true. Um, right, and the others like Okot to be taken. They have taken a, a, a rather radical stance against Christianity. And um, I think we have to agree with them where they have spoken clearly and, and correctly about the misfortunes that came about through the, the introduction of Christianity by, by Western missionaries, but also by African Christ, uh, converts who disregarded um, African cultures, African way of life. Uh, you can see that even in Chinu Achebe's book, Things Fall Up, where a new convert goes, goes and kills the sacred python, python, and there's a big fallout. Um, whereas the first missionary, um, I think it was Reverend Brown, 
had come and he had understood the people, understood the culture, he would sit down with the chief, Chief Akuma, and they would discuss. They would even do theology with the traditional chief. They would speak about his God. They would speak about Chuku, the God of, the, of his people, the, the, the chief. And it was an amicable, um, respectful engagement. He doesn't go destroying the shrines or, 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 or the people's way of life. So there, this is, we have to acknowledge that there have been times, and there have been many times, that our missionaries or we African converts uh, to Christianity, we have, we have betrayed our people in the things that we have said and done. Um, I think some, some of the criticism also is extreme and maybe even unwarranted. And I would like to, to take the example of, um, of Wole Shoinka, for instance. Really, when you understand Wole Shoinka as a person, where he comes from, he doesn't have much at all that he, should, he could write against Christianity. He comes from a very robustly Christian family. His family are leading lumin Christians, luminaries in education. The Ransom Ekuti's family that I mentioned, uh, it was Dao, um, uh, Israel allowed to Ransom Ekuti, Shoinka's maternal uncle, who served in the, in the Elliott Commission that was charged by the British, the colonial government, to set up institutions of higher learning in Africa, and West Africa particularly. So the University of Ibadan, the University of Lagon, he was part of that Elliott Commission. And Shawinka writes very fondly about his uncle. Um, he calls him Daudu, Daudu, and he says he's his favorite uncle. He doesn't have anything wrong, sad, bad to say about his uncle. If anything, he writes very in, in the first memoir, Ake. He's very pr prolific about how this uncle was a man of a, a just man. He was a teacher, but he would catch students doing criminal things and he would give them a chance to defend themselves. And if you mounted a good defense, he would let you go, even though you stole a chicken and ate it. So he speaks very fondly of his uncle. And I have had um, opportunities to correspond with Shoinka by, by email and even spoken to him. And I, I once raised the question of his uncle. And I said, you have spoken so fondly of your uncle about his education, his, his experiences, and so on. But you haven't said much about his faith. What do you have to say about his faith? And he wrote back the same day. I was very pleased that he responded. And he said, oh, I don't have time to ask every question. If I, if I answered every question that was sent to me, I would not have time to, to write any more. So basically, he dodged, he dodged the question. He, and then his mother, I had asked him another question in my first email. Why do you call your mother wild Christian? And I thought he would say some wild things about his mother. But all he said was, oh, my mother was indeed wild with a stick. He was a disciplinarian. And he, go, he went ahead to talk about how his mother was a, uh, someone who... who, who who, who valued integrity, and he, he, pun, he punished any wrongdoing that was uh, deemed to fall short of her standards. So again, nothing if uh, his mother. So I, I think, I think um, the answer that uh, Professor Oluwiwa, Oluwiwa Awe gave me, this is a Cambridge trained physicist at Ibadan. Uh, he's, now, he's now going to be the Lord. He retired as a scientist and became a pastor of a small evangelical church, charismatic church, actually. He was Shoinka's friend. You know, they, they, were, they went to the same school. He was one of the seven uh, pirates. I don't know whether you've heard the pirates. They set up the Pirates Confraternity, the original Pirates Confraternity in Nigeria. So I asked Professor Olumui, why did Shoinka abandon Christianity? Do you know the reasons for his decision? And he said, ah, you know, the man has become a good writer. He has created a niche market. So he has to stay there. That's how he responded. <laughs> and I think that's how, uh, I, I think some of our, our um, antagonists, you know, radical critics, um, really, they don't have much, much bad to say about Jesus. It's just perhaps the way Christianity was presented or their own positions they want to protect. Um, 
So um, there's probably more to say to that, uh, but for the next question, um, uh, Reverend Dr. Blasu, the, the question about Africanization of Christianity, yes, it was an enterprise that had, had gained momentum in the 70s, having been initiated, you know, a little bit earlier on, but prominent in the 70s, you identified it. Um, why does Shoinka describe this Tawani African theologian, including his compatriot Ido, as actually the Again, if you press Wole Shoinka, and if you look at his writing, he does not give a justifiable answer. For instance, in the same book that I, 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 I used to have as a basis for this discussion, myth, literature, and the African world, you saw, you saw in the quote that he, he, he lists the names of these African theologians, Willie Abraham, Biti, Ogotomele, and then Ido. On the same page, now, it, with the same breath, he says, oh, uh, Ido has written an excellent book, an otherwise excellent book. Now, the book that Wole Shoenka is referring to is Ido's Olo. Lord Omari, God of Yoruba religion, or Lord the, Omari. The, 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 the were to come. Now, I have raised the question, why do you call him a cultural denier and then say he has written an excellent book about the Yoruba God, or Lord Omari, but he does not give um, an, a, a, an in-depth analysis or critique of the African theologian's work. So some of these things I just said, and left hanging, and because they, these are prominent voices, Wole Shoinka, Kofi Awuno, Gugi Wationgo, they can just say it without justifying it, and, and these things stick. They stick in the psyche, they stick, stick in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the media, they stick in the academic circles, but without justification, so they get away with it. So there's nowhere, as far as I have read Shoinka, and I have read it, I've read all of Shoinka's works and beyond, even about him by others, many. There's nowhere he gives a justifiable reason why he would call Ido, for instance, his own compatriot, as a cultural denier. If anything, he exalts him by saying he's written an otherwise excellent book. So again, they get a, they, 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 they make these statements, and they were showing that showing does, but he does not justify justify them adequately. So I think that's how I'd, I'd respond to that question. Um, yeah, but earlier on, before Shoinka had critiqued African theologians as cultural deniers, people like Okot Ibitek had accused African theologians of parading African gods in you know in European streets and so on and dressing them with European garb, um, obviously calling, questioning the whole indigenization process, the Africanization of African religions and traditions and the gods. So they felt uncomfortable that these African theologians, and by the way, the African theologians were always ahead those days. Maybe things have changed now. They were always ahead of um, the literary writers, the creative writers, in engaging the traditional, um, uh, you know, um, traditional religions and, and ideas. So, so, so it's a reaction. It's a reaction and, and yeah, it feels like a betrayal, but, but if you have understood Miti or, 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 or Oido or, or even Bidiako or Kwesi Dixon, the things they say about African traditional heritage, they're wholly positive. In fact, these are the people who have pro probably done more to, to make a case for those um, um, traditions and spirituality uh, than perhaps the literary uh, scholars themselves. And we continue to do, I mean, we are their, their disciples, we continue to do that today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Waigi. Dr. Waigi, uh, what I wanted to ask is that while you are going through um, the writings of both the theologians and also, um, I wouldn't want to describe them as secular, 
but uh, as they as they were writing, one thing that you can see is that, I mean, there is a clash of the world, and I don't know what if that really is what informs how they end up writing or the kind of struggles they have to go through to bring out uh, uh, the kind of writing that they have. What are some of the struggles? I mean, having uh, had an opportunity to uh, interview Wole Shoinka, what are some of his struggles while putting this message across? Oh, um, so let me just clarify, uh, Dr. Gaina. Uh, so when you talk about struggle, do, do you mean both um, struggles experienced by the theologians, the near African theologians, as well as great African Yes, please. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> by the way, Shoinka would, would, would very robustly dismiss the idea of clash of cultures. Or, or clash of worlds. He says there can never be such a thing as clash of cultures on the on the on the soil of um, on the on the soil of one of the cultures. He says that the the, 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 the the natives culture will always uh, triumph over the, the the alien culture. So he said there's no 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 such thing as a clash of cultures, um, especially when it's done on the indigenous uh, uh, soil. The native soil. I don't know what to make of that, but um, well, I, I think I, I hope first of, first of all, in my presentation of creative African writers, I hope you 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 recognize that I begin by affirming those those works, even celebrating them. So in identifying the 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 three themes, the tripartite framework, in the works of Wole Shoinka and other African writers, I'm also identifying the, their significance, their, their depth in quality and, and relevance uh, for us even as theologians. I mean, I've spent more than 10 years, I said 10 years, in fact, it's probably 15 years, uh, reading purposely, deliberately, uh, African writings, you know, creative writers, the plays, the poems. Uh, and I think that it's a minefield of ideas, a minefield of uh, wisdom, uh, a minefield of affirmation. You know, if if you want to feel affirmed, read Tinu Achebe. You, as an African, you know, you feel very restored because of the way he writes and the way he speaks. If you've heard him speak, so I begin by celebrating their contribution, alongside the contribution of African theologians. They are, after all, compatriots. These early African writers like Shoinka, Achebe, um, J.P. Clark, Okibo, and others, they are, they, are, they are compatriots and contemporaries of the African writers, uh, theologians that we speak of. And because of that, because they are children of the, of the same, type, same generation, they have also gone through the same struggles. For instance, I, I should have mentioned this in the presentation, but I didn't. It is at the University of Ibadan where religion was taught for the first time as an academic discipline. Now, how did that come about? It is Chinua Achebe himself who tells us that it is they. His, this Chinua Achebe was the second generation students at um, University College Baden, having come from Omohia. He says, we are the ones who demanded to be taught our religions in school. It is the students who demanded. Why did they demand? They wanted to, to, to learn more about religions. So there was a struggle there. They were being taught about, of course, Christianity, about, about Greek religion. They were being taught Latin. These are the generations that even learned things like Latin and, and read really, really widely the classics, English literature. But they felt shortchanged, you know. In fact, one of the teachers, who Dr. James, um, who had come from Britain to teach them at Ibadan, um, former BBC man, comes as a teacher at Ibadan. Um, he once made this confession that Achebe um, narrates in one of his books. He says, he said to them, I can only teach you what I know. I cannot teach you what I don't know. So there's a sense in which this, uh, this uh, first pioneer, um, this early generation of 
African scholars, they, they, were, they, were, they needed to be taught things that their teachers were not equipped to teach them. And you see that with people like Bolagido and people like Mbiti, the books they wrote, uh, Olo Dumare, God of Yoruba Religion, um, African Traditional Religion, Concept of God, Prayers of African Religion, by Mbiti, these are books nobody taught them how to write them or nobody gave them the content. They had to research themselves, for themselves. In fact, when they began teaching these things, for instance, um, John Beatty at University of Cambridge, and then Makerere, and of course Ibadan and other places, they, they taught things that nobody taught them. You had sometimes a case of someone like Jeffrey Parinda, who was a good British teacher, <coughs> who had himself learned from and acquired some material from Edwin W. Smith, and he taught traditional religions, and he gave them kind of um, a head start. But they had to discover for themselves. Uh, so there was that struggle, and this was whether you are a Christian or not. And then you then had to go abroad to study, of course, coming to England. The colleges that were set up were uh, university colleges of London, of um, Oxford and so on, Legon, Ibadan and so on. And you had to come to Britain to complete your degree. They're coming to a, a, a world that is full of racism. You know, there's wild wars going on, so traveling is not easy. Um, there was a, po a poem, a very early poem that Shoinka wrote. I've, I've been connected with the places where he lived when he was uh, in Britain. It's called Telephone Conversation. And when Shoinka, in this telephone conversation, he, he is lamenting racism that he experienced. And he's, he calls a lady and I says, I would like to rent your room. I've seen you advertise your room. And because of the way he speaks, this lady asks him, where do you come from? And Shrinka says, oh, I, I, I'm a student at Leeds. Isn't that enough? So the, that confrontation, and then the lady de declines to, to offer him a room. Why? Because he's a foreigner, a black African. So, so, so Shrinka is the creative. He takes, he takes his energies and he consoles himself by writing a poem or a... Or, or, or a, or a or a play. So he writes telephone conversation. So there were these struggles, struggles to do with the times, you know, of course colonialism is, is there, racism, um, the things that they are learning, but also going beyond that, rising above those, those challenges to, to, may I just say one more uh, about um, Chinu Achebe. Chinu Achebe began writing a reaction to what other people were writing about Africans. So he talks about uh, 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 Joyce, um, Joseph Conrad and jo James Joyce, who had written novels about Nigerians. And um, Chino Achebe says, I read these novels about these Nigerians they're writing about. I don't even recognize them as, 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 as Nigerians. So, so he says, that's how he began to write uh, things fall apart. He said, I want to give an account of myself, of my people. I don't want other people to speak for myself. So that is show. Uh, um, Achebe. He doesn't write as a Christian, but that's the same way African theologians write. They want to give their own account. They want to speak and write as representatives of their own people. So, so they're concerned for that. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Waigi, for that uh, exciting conversation that you've started. Uh, and just because of time, we have to stop at that. But we know that it's something that we'll continue to talk about and also to consider, uh, even in our own uh, in our own understanding, especially when it comes to the creative arts uh, in matters of writing. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for for that insightful very exciting and also taking us through uh, down uh, the history of, of writing especially with our first um, African writers and also the fact that uh, this is something that I got to know from Professor Wolf uh, we were just having a random conversation how Africa was the first to be able to ask for school of religions before the, even the West could actually do that. And so it means that we've actually fought and we continue to fight. 
and we continue to have this conversation, it is not ending now because it's something that is continuous and it's something that needs to be addressed. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weigi. A round of applause to, uh, to him. Thank you very much. So we'll now take a break, a tea break, and then we'll uh, assemble back at 12 for another session. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Yeah, for the tea break, we are taking it uh, just outside. If you go down to the ground floor, there's a pagoda outside, and the tea is there. So you're all encouraged to go down and take the food. Is, the tea is there. The tea, the tea and some pastry is there. So let's all go down and enjoy it. Yes. Yes, sir, please. Those online, I'm sorry, you will have to take yours virtually. <laughs> yeah. Kofi Kristala Institute of Theology, Mission and Culture, ACI, is a postgraduate research and training institution that focuses on African Christianity. It was founded in 1987 by Professor Kwame Beriako, who, with others, recognized the shift in the center of gravity of Christianity from Europe and North America to the southern continents, Africa, Latin America, Asia, and the South Pacific. Whereas at the beginning of the 20th century, about 80% of Christians lived in the West, now less than 40% live there, with the 60% and more living in the southern continents. This demographic fact places tremendous responsibility upon the church in Africa and makes African Christianity a field for active study and research so as to equip for more effective mission and ministry. Akrofi Kristala Institute exists to help the church rise to its responsibilities and meet the challenge. To achieve its objectives, ACI has developed the Master of Arts in Theology and Mission with a number of possible options, Biblical Studies, Pentecostal Studies, Holistic Mission and Development, Leadership, Mother Tongue Theology, and Bible and Science. ACI also offers the Master of Theology program with options in African Christianity and Bible translation and interpretation. Then the Doctor of Philosophy program in theology focuses on African and world Christianity and Bible translation and interpretation. Christian leadership in Africa and beyond will greatly benefit from the curriculum that enables those eager to equip themselves for mission and ministry to appreciate the realities of the African cultural and religious setting, as well as African Christian experience and consequently engage more effectively with today's ministry challenges. To support the achievement of these laudable objectives, the Johannes Zimmerman Library is available for the use of students and visiting researchers. It houses about 30,000 volumes of literature and journals specializing in theology and the history of Christianity in Africa. It includes indigenous language materials as well as other special collections in African history, language, and culture. The Johannes Zimmerman Library also has an archive, preserving archival materials at the Basel Mission and the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, as well as other ancient records of Christian history in Ghana. In addition, ACI is a subscriber to several databases, which enable researchers to be truly international in their range of research. The offices and seminar rooms of ACI are housed in the historic Basel House, originally constructed between 1848 and 1860 to accommodate students who were trained to become teacher catechists of the Basel Mission Church and later the Presbyterian Church. Just adjacent to Basel House is the newest student's hostel, which has spacious and comfortable accommodation for the many students who prefer to be housed on campus to give undivided attention to their studies. 
for guests and senior visitors to ACI, the historic Coconut House, also constructed in the 19th century, is available. Adjacent to Coconut House is a cafeteria, which offers full board in a deliciously delightful way, as demonstrated in the early African University, the Museum of Alexandria, eating and theology form a very fruitful pair. Akrofi Cristala Institute is situated in Akropong Aquapim, about 50 kilometers from Accra. But the town itself is historic, being the seat of the Aquapim Paramount Sea and is known for its annual Odura Festival, which continues the heritage of Aquapim religion and culture. Interestingly, ACI students observe this festival with a view to understanding how the religious and cultural aspirations it embodies may be turned to Christ. One of the core values of ACI is excellence, and it seeks to achieve this in all aspects of its life. It is no wonder that it was the first private theological institution to receive a presidential charter to award its own degrees. Again, it is the only theological institution in Ghana to graduate a substantial number of PhDs from across the African continent and beyond who are now members of its alumni association. Indeed, ACI is an international institution with faculty from three continents and it attracts students from across Africa and around the world, making its community truly international. Come visit us sometime, or better still, Join us on campus for an exciting journey into theology and mission studies, all aimed at making the Church of Christ more effective in its ministry.